Thank you very much. You may be seated. The Chair of the Council of Governors, Governor Anwaiguru, the Deputy, other governors who are here present today, all protocols of service, ladies and gentlemen, Hamjambo. Hamjambo Tena. Hey, I feel very, very delighted and intimidated <laughs> to be in front of you here today. I am happy to come. I was invited to come, and I was reminded that this is the eighth of uh, the summit that you're holding. And I just realized that I have been with you in all the eight summits that you have held. So I was very happy to come again here today. Now, before I say anything else, I just want to introduce those who have come with me. Two of you have already been introduced. You are former, immediate former chairman, Governor Wycliffe Ambersa of Paranya, former Governor Kakamega, and Governor Mwangi Wairia. But I'm also here with the former Minister for Defense, the leader of DNA Party, on Eugene Wamalwa. I'm also here with the Chairman of Roots Party, Professor George Wajakoya. Those are Wanazimi uh, who have accompanied me to come here. We are all very delighted. And uh, seeing what is the media today, and also seeing what was said yesterday, I wonder what I should uh, uh, term my talk to you today. I looked at all the messages were given yesterday, and I said, maybe, it's like Swahili say, that nyani uh, haoni kundule. That means that the baboon does not see his back or his buttocks. So when the baboons are up on the tree, the one which is lower down looks at the one which is higher up and saying, yef, yef. <laughs> and laughs at the other one saying that his buttocks are, 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 are red. And he does not know that his buttocks are also red. <laughs> this is what I saw yesterday. And maybe when I talk, you would realize where I mean, what I mean. It is a pleasure to be here with you today to celebrate a decade of devolution. I want to take this early opportunity to commend the Council of Governors. You have been able to find a way around our sometimes toxic and divisive politics. You have been able to create a leadership that looks past party and political differences and moves you forward as a team. I commend you for your ability to mend fences and build bridges. I want to encourage you to continue on this path of consensus building, mutual respect, and decorum. Ten years into the evolution, Kenya is a much transformed landscape with an amazing opportunity for rural economic revival and transformation. There is now economic life in rural areas. Some previously dead towns and market centers are beaming with the life after the evolution. The prospect of Kenyans taking charge of their destiny and driving their own development is alive today because of devolution. A new middle class, whose members have not stepped into any major city in Kenya, is rising in the villages across Kenya, thanks to devolution. 
Devolution's success is a success story. It's a testimony to what we can achieve as a nation when we decide to pursue big dreams, no matter how daunting the obstacles may seem. As a country, we must congratulate ourselves for having endorsed devolution 13 years ago. And we must always remember it was not an easy victory. When we first unveiled devolution as a campaign platform in 2007 election, the proponents, including yours truly, were vilified and accused of planning to break Kenya up. We stood our ground and pushed devolution into every political conversation in Kenya, and we won. I am aware that even today, as you try to imagine and dream how best devolution can deliver more for our people, as you try to test and stretch the limits of devolution, you face skepticism and fears that you may be wrong and that it might destroy your political careers. My advice is that you dream on and soldier on. And I know that anybody who decides to go and run as a governor is himself already a, a convict, a, a, a convinced that the revolution can work. And I encourage you to remember the words of President Franklin Roosevelt. I quote, the only limit to our realization of tomorrow will be our doubts of today. Let us move forward with a strong and active faith, unquote. Devolution continues to have doubters, but devolution can no longer be a loser without the nation losing. Excellencies, at this forum, I have the warm feeling of a person among friends who think alike and have the same goals and aspirations. As far as the evolution goes, my aspirations and those of the governors are aligned. We may have differed here and, and there about the management of our affairs at both the national and county levels. But when it comes to devolution, I believe our differences are only as to the method of attaining a goal. There has never been, and there shall never be, an argument between us about the goal. We all appreciate devolution. We all want devolution. In some counties, devolution was achieved in 10 years what the national government was never able to achieve in 50 years. We know the challenges facing devolution. For instance, funding remains inadequate and is slow, uneven, and unpredictable. The control of budget and central bank need to relook at the law the County Allocation of Revenue Act, CARA, contains a disbursement schedule. And I was sitting next to the former governor, who is now the Minister for Finance, and I told him exactly the same thing. Therefore, the administrative step of Treasury writing a letter to CBK to release funds should not arise. CBK should implement CARA full stop. <laughs> Bureaucracy at the Office of the Controller of Budget continues to hold back devolution. There is a worrying cash clash of vision and responsibility between county chief executives and the members of county assemblies. As the first port of call across the villages, MCAs have real concerns like remuneration and facilitation that ought to be addressed. 
that ought to be addressed in the interest of harmonious working relationship with the county dream bearers who are the governors. And you will see the Nyani uh, Aoni uh, Kunduli. Across the 47 counties, the wage bill has become uncontrollable and continues to eat into what should go into the development. Even more worrying is the continuing, continuing de duplication of functions. More money continues to be spent at Apia House, Kilim House, and Maji House in Nairobi for the roads that are devolved. In the Finance Act 2023, the budget for health has grown by 32 billion shillings at the national level. Recurrent expenditure alone has increased by 17%, yet most of the health functions are devolved. Today, fertilizers are procured and distributed by the national government. Affordable housing is being conceptualized and implemented by the national government. The, na the, the national the government, government wants to build markets and employ community health workers. All these are devolved functions whose money should be released to the counties. Ten years into devolution, this tug of war between the counties and the national government needs to come to an end. In this tug of war, the Commission of Revenue Allocation continues to be ignored, making revenue sharing between national and county governments and among counties uneven and more political than professional. As we castigate the national government, let us worry over devolved corruption. Oversight seems concentrated at the national level, while the graft stalks revolution at every turn. The interplay between oversight institutions like the county assemblies Auditor General, the Senate, and the investigative and procuratorial arms is weak, and the institutions not working together. But I want to say that it's not, not only that the corruption has been devolved, corruption has also remained very big at the national level. So the national level has no business talking to you about devolved corruption. When assemblies and the Senate inquire into a matter, the best they can do is recommend investigation. When investigators complete their work, the best they can do is to recommend prosecution. And there is, of course, no guarantee that the courts will punish the wrongdoers. Let us address these man-made challenges once and for all, so that we can unleash the full transformative capacities of our counties. We need a constant and consistent monitoring of all laws governing devolution to ensure their implementation and to add statutes whenever they are needed. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we meet at a time our country is facing real grave threats. This is a reality check backed by government data. The economy is struggling. Our national currency is severely weakened. The shilling has fallen by 10% since March this year. Our people have been hit hard by punitive taxes and consequent rise in the cost of living. We have run away unemployment. Our healthcare system is broken. We face challenges with food security at a time climate change is turning everything upside down. 
from farming to health care to provision of water and infrastructure, nothing is the same or predictable anymore. Unfortunately for governors, you are stationed where the desperation, the need, and the expectations are highest. That is, at the grassroots, where people want instant solutions. I believe that as a country, we are lucky to be going through these challenges in the era of devolution. I believe that if county governments were not here to, to absorb some of the shock and act as cushion, the economic and governance challenges Kenya is going through today would have overwhelmed and overrun the national government. To continue providing buffers for our country and respond to the cries of the people, counties need a tremendous amount of financial resources in a timely and predictable manner. The national government, therefore, needs to understand and appreciate counties as necessary partners in the journey for a successful Kenya. The problems and responsibilities the people and the counties face today demand that we reevaluate re and strengthen our commitment to preserve the place of the county government and bestow it with the power, the authority, the responsibilities, and the revenues necessary to discharge those roles and meet expectations. In times like these, county government may be tempted to do what the national government is doing, which is to increase charges for services they provide to generate more revenue. And I was listening to the talk about its own revenue. I see it differently. I believe this is the time for county government to act compassionately and responsibly. The problems our people face today require that we invest within our means in programs that create jobs and put money into the people's pockets. <laughs> Counties don't have to copy and paste what the national government is doing. I encourage you to be own models for innovation and creativity. Rather than extract more from the pockets of equally suffering masses, I encourage you to continue to provide communities and families with the tools they need to succeed so that they can in return finance counties without too much pain. Being on the ground, governors have no time to get into a lot of ideological debates that consume our politics in Nairobi. Counties should have no time for merely making com com commitments and announcements. Governors have to be practical. You will do well and set examples when you back up your pronouncements with co concrete action at the level of policy and practice. I believe that the work that you do, if done well, will with time have a concrete impact on the debate at the national level. This is the time to provide record amounts of assistance to our farmers to enable them to save us from the routines of farming, food imports, and food inflation. This is the time for financial inclusion programs and ensure the money reaches the intended recipients. This is the time to work on turning your, your towns into smart cities of tomorrow, equipped with world-class amenities. I encourage you to soldier on and double your efforts at light manufacturing and the value addition as a way of generating revenue and putting money into people's pockets. With focus, you should be able to set up world-class investment and industrial regions along the dedicated corridors of your counties to aid manufacturing. 
I want to encourage you to particularly promote labor-intensive manufacturing because it puts money into the people's pockets. And I'm talking to you as a manufacturing engineer. Put focus on building infrastructure, including roads, electricity, and water, and farm irrigation. This will yield returns. We have to ensure that our policies are predictable and tax regimes stable. Ease of doing business in your counties must be therefore be a prime concern. Investors need to the assurance that the rules of engagement are the easiest that can be. Remove bureaucracy. With such clarity, you will be able to create employment opportunities, encourage an enterprise, and to create a bigger job market for our youth, widening your base for revenue. I believe it is time, again within your means, to allocate some of the money from all revenue to a cash transfer program to help protect the poor at the grassroots. I want to encourage you to continue with cooperation between counties. At the same time, however, we need a competitive element among counties to prevent the temptation to just maintain the status quo. Let us com compete even as you cooperate. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, I want to disclose to you a reality slowly taking shape in our country, but which many of us, including the governors, may not notice. While national politicians may be getting all the attention, the action of translating policies into improvement of livelihoods is actually being determined by governors, county assemblies, and county governments. I see immense possibility for our county-driven growth and leadership in our country. I see potential for a county-driven quantum leap in our country. This hidden reality is not limited to one section of our own region. The potential is unlimited. Be open to ideas, investments, and innovations. You may just be the team that put the country on the path to a reversible takeoff. I want to conclude by referring to what Governor Jonathan B. said, the host governor, that uh, they are expecting bumper harvest in this region because uh, they did mandamanos in the farms instead of doing the mandamanos on the streets, also carrying sufurias. I want to tell him that this katiba that we have is a product of mandaman. <laughs> and I also want to remind that uh, if mandamano can help the families whose uh, children were cheated or money being taken to Finland. There's nothing wrong with Amanda Mano. <laughs> what is wrong is police brutality. And finally, you want to tell a rogue ambassador, leave Kenyans alone. If Manamano can lead to a dialogue between uh, Ichungwa and Kalonzo, everything is good with Manamano. Tell the rogue ambassador, Kenya is not United States. Kenya is not a colony of the United States. Keep your, your mouth shut here. Otherwise, you will call for your recall back to your country. I thank you, ladies and gentlemen.
Thank you very much. Another round of applause, please, for the former Prime Minister, Right Honorable Raila Odinga. Asante Sana. Our guests would like now to welcome the chair of the council plus other governors for a photo session. But we are also going to have a gift courtesy of the Council of Governors Steering Committee that uh, organized the Devolution Conference. So this photo is the Right Honorable Prime Minister and the 47 governors, those who were present. The next photo is going to be the Right Honorable Prime Minister and Senators present. <laughs> Asante Nisana, Asante Sana. Oh, Governor Malombo was not caught in the photo. Oh, there you go. Asante Nisana. Next up, I'll call 